thank you for uh, organizing this conference. Um, I'm going to be speaking about a slightly different topic from the previous two speakers, which is uh, uh, basic neurophysiology. And we're looking specifically at the transition from the seizure to, or for the, the pre-seizure to the seizure state in human and animal recordings. So if, uh, to, from the point of view of a clinician um, in um, conducting epilepsy surgery procedures, we very much care about what EEG recordings tell us about the locations of seizure onset and spread. And so it becomes very important to understand what they, uh, what information is being conveyed and what information is perhaps not so evident in an EEG recording. So we're going to discuss quickly in this talk um, questions such as, what is the ictal transition exactly, and what neural firing patterns determine uh, when this transition takes place, and what are the mechanisms that might be operating at this time. So if you um, imagine a seizure focus and you somehow manage to record a single neuron in, uh, say, a patient with focal epilepsy during an event, this is roughly what you would expect to see. This is actually a mouse recording of a seizure. Uh, and what you can see here is that there is an abrupt ictal transition um, heralded by tonic firing, followed by uh, a series of bursts, which are known as paroxysmal depolarizing shifts. And if you look at the action potential wave shapes, you can see that there is a very dramatic change. Um, there is a loss of amplitude and a widening of the action potential waveform. Um, and um, I'll, to make a long story short, when we look at single unit or multi-unit activity during a seizure in a patient, we see much the same thing. There is an abrupt ictal transition from the pre-seizure to the seizure state with all these same hallmarks. Unfortunately, um, life is not that easy for, uh, for us, and it's important to uh, examine the relationship between multi-unit activity and uh, the EEG that's being recorded. So we were able to take the recordings from these same neurons and filter it to produce multi-unit activity on the top of the screen here and an EEG equivalent on the bottom of the screen here, which corresponds to what was being recorded from the nearby clinical electrodes. And what we see here is that that tonic uh, firing that heralds the ictal transition is, is uh, moving slowly in what we call an ictal wavefront that, trans that uh, uh, tracks across this, um, the area spanned by the array that we're using at a very slow pace. Um, there's a one second marker here that I will draw your attention to, which means that it took about five seconds for this wave to, trans, uh, to um, move across this four millimeter area we're recording from. Now, if you look at our EEG recording, you can see that um, in, um, the EEG tells us that the seizure starts about here. So we're gonna call that a global seizure onset when the seizure starts somewhere somewhere in the brain, but that at any given site, for example, electrode D, the ictal transition occurs up to several seconds later in what I'm going to call a delayed onset. And that is the moment of the transition that we're concerned with here. Um, and uh, now, you don't always see this on recordings. We actually have a very small number of patient recordings that show this pattern. What is seen more often in, uh, with other groups and with our own recordings is that you don't find uh, the, these hallmarks of an abrupt ictal transition and a, um, and a transition to uh, rhythmic bursting. And so this has been proposed as perhaps a different firing pattern that represents a different type of seizure activity, which would certainly raise many new questions. Um, however, our feeling has been that uh, these recordings represent um, activity recorded outside of this area defined by the ictal wavefront. And we have uh, finally obtained a recording that recorded straddle the edge of this wavefront and was able to show us both of these patterns in a single patient, in a single seizure, in a single Utari recording. So on top here is what happens when you're outside of our seizure area. And you can see that there is, 
a uh, maintenance of the um, of firing with um, with consistent amplitude and no evidence of a tonic firing phase or a transition, whereas another um, electrode just a millimeter or so away shows this, that transition with a tonic firing wave, an ictal wave front, and a transition to burst firing. Um, and, um, and when we examine this um, in terms of in this, this same patient in terms of firing rate and spike wave shape changes, we again see that um, there was a, a wave that reached about this far around the midpoint of uh, the diagonal of this array. And we see it all also when we look at changes in, the, in this um, spike wave shape. We look, we're looking here at full width half maximum, which is a measure that will be uh, less susceptible to uh, technical changes in the recording as a seizure progresses. And uh, pre-ictally, there is a, a, a very even distribution of this measure in spikes uh, detected across the array. Um, after seizure onset, but before the ictal wavefront arrives, you can see that things are a little more noisy, but there still isn't much of a change across, uh, across the array's geometry. Um, and then after recruitment, we see that um, neurons in that um, recruited region in the corner are now showing um, increased uh, um, wave shape duration, which is another indication that the ictal transition has taken place only in that location. So what, we're, what we've seen here and uh, in our prior publications is um, in our existing data is that there is a, um, a global onset versus delayed onset that is something that must be kept in mind whenever you're looking at an ictal transition study because um, there is a, certainly a difference between seizure onset and seizure propagation, but it's not always obvious which one of those you're examining. Uh, we also um, propose that the ictal transition is marked by a wavefront of tonic firing. It is uh, a seen in a limited spatial location, which means that it's um, potentially difficult to find uh, when you're sampling with um, sparsely placed electrodes. There are marked uh, waveform changes at the ictal transition. We'll explain later why that's important. And there is a sharp transition from free recruitment to an ictal wavefront phase, which is not at all evident in an EEG recording, um, which certainly makes um, clinical lives difficult when we're trying to determine this based on EEG. And what we're going to focus on here is why this is happening. So at the time period before the um, this abrupt shift to tonic firing, there is this um, pronounced mismatch between field potentials, which are showing the presence of rhythmic act synaptic activity and neural firing, which is very much um, not following or not producing that synaptic rhythm. In other words, the synaptic rhythm is, um, is being um, transmitted here, but neurons are not responding to it. And what's going on here, as shown in um, Andy Trevelyan's work back in the mid-2000s, is that there's this powerful inhibitory veto that's operating at this time, which um, has to actually fail abruptly in order to permit a seizure to emerge at this site. So I'm going to focus now on mechanisms um, that might explain why these inhibitory failure occurs there, are, um, there have been a number of proposals. Um, I've listed some of the uh, key papers here. Um, apologies to anyone whose paper I may have missed. This is not uh, exhaustive by any means. And um, the main mechanisms that have been investigated, uh, first of all, impaired chloride regulation in which uh, chloride accumulates inside pyramidal cells um, altering the uh, um, membrane currents, the GABA currents that um, that um, and, and thus affecting the effectiveness of um, interneurons. Um, rebound excitation is another um, proposal that's been put forward by a couple of groups in which um, there is an initial burst of interneuron firing, which results in um, uh, afterwards a rebound excitation in which pyramidal cells fire abnormally and trigger a seizure. There's also potentially a role for depolarization block. Depolarization block is a feature in which um, 
neurons that are driven by a very high level of excitation um, actually um, reach a saturation point and stop firing. Uh, this can obviously alter um, the dynamics of excitation inhibition when this happens. And then finally, there's um, potentially a role for high extra uh, for alterations of potassium and calcium currents that I'm not going to go into in detail, but I'm pointing you to a couple of the papers here. So uh, there are a number of papers now reporting that before the ictal transition, there is an increase in intraneuron firing. And this is one of the recent ones um, looking at this using an optogenetic technique that allowed them to look specifically at the firing of, um, of uh, different interneuron populations with high accuracy. And what they found is that at the ictal, but prior to the ictal onset, which was defined as the local onset, um, interneurons, especially parvalbumin interneurons, dramatically increase their firing, which suggests that interneurons are not, or, or rather, the inhibitory failure is not due to the cessation of firing of interneurons, but rather a loss of their function. Um, and, uh, however, the rebound excitation idea um, proposes a different mechanism in which there is an initial burst of interneurons, but um, this burst, when it, be, when it ends, has resulted in a, in a large increase in potassium, uh, um, extracellular potassium, which triggers, in turn, an increase in pyramidal cell firing greater than what happens indirectly and which uh, drives a seizure. And there may also be um, a timing, um, in timing involved in here. So at the end of the burst, pyramidal cells are released because all the interneurons stop firing at the same time. Um, there's been probably more work done on uh, chloride dysregulation. Um, there was a, a notable paper that I encourage everyone to take a look at, um, published in 2014. It was a slice study of peritumoral tissue from uh, patients undergoing glioma resection, um, and this uh, and, and these investigators noticed that when a spontaneous interictal discharge occurred, there's, there was a lead-in of interneuron firing prior to pyramidal cell firing. And when they did patch clamping, they noticed that there was a depolarizing GABA response. In other words, um, these interneurons had become excitatory. And uh, that suggests a reversal of the GABA current, which has also been documented by some other investigators under certain conditions. And when they evaluated the uh, chloride transporters in this peritumoral tissue, they could see that there was an increase in um, NKCC1 and a decrease in KCC2, both of which would impair the ability of a cell to clear chloride. And indeed, when they uh, um, used bumetanide, which blocks NKCC1 receptors, these interictal discharges were suppressed. Um, in a, in a follow-up study to this, using um, an optogenetic study, um, uh, um, able to um, um, drive chloride into or out of cells um, in Andy Trevelyan's lab, um, they uh, found that um, that this that driving chloride into cells enhanced the uh, susceptibility to seizures, although it did not result in in, in um, seizure-like events occurring spontaneously. This is an in vitro study. Um, however, there is also an out-of-phase effect on interneuron firing, which um, which resulted in fast ripples occurring. Um, so again, supportive evidence that this is a very important mechanism potentially for uh, enhancing uh, the susceptibility to seizure. And then um, depolarization block has been studied mainly in computational modeling. Um, this is a recent article put out by um, my collaborator in Chicago, uh, Dr. Wim Van Drongelen, in, in, our, in our lab. And, um, and the proposal here is quite simple. If you have, for a given synaptic input, as the, um, as the excitatory um, input increases, it turns out that the reaction of neurons depends on their size. In other words, for neurons, size matters. A large neuron will be a little less affected, but interneurons being small will reach saturation much more quickly. And so what you have is interneurons will saturate and stop firing before um, a pyramidal cell will. 
And uh, this results outside of the ictal transition in the jitter of the interneuron um, firing timing, which um, which could which uh, also is similar to what's been noticed with the uh, with the chloride mechanism. So uh, it would be so our next um, goal was to see if we could find some support or uh, or uh, or or somehow validate any of these uh, any of these mechanisms by looking at single unit activity in uh, during human seizures. And the first thing you have to address when you're doing this, in other words, taking multi unit activity and identifying single unit firing, is you have to solve this problem which is that during a seizure, it's impossible to spike sort using normal uh, conventional means. And what we see here is on the left, but before the seizure occurs, there is a very well-defined cluster of, um, of um, action potential waveforms in purple. And that cluster after the seizure is over reemerges and is present again. So it should be present during the seizure, but it's completely lost in this uh, noise and it actually appears to have disappeared. So um, what uh, Ed Merricks did, who's been in uh, with my lab since um, in, for the last four years, is to develop a uh, template matching technique in order to overcome this problem. And uh, what he effectively does is draw a convex hull around the spikes, um, identify the pre-ictal waveforms, and then recover those same waveforms from uh, the uh, ictal recording. And then because this, uh, this will recover many of the waveforms, but it'll also capture some noise, and so to minimize the noise, you remove some outliers, and now you have a much better idea of what's uh, happening during the seizure. And then once you have that, you can also classify units according to whether they are fast spiking interneurons, which are largely um, parvalbumin interneurons, which is the population we're most interested in, and all other cells. And these include some interneuron populations, but they are largely uh, pyramidal cells. Um, so that gives us a decent basis for comparison, but understand it's not perfect. So when we do this, we find that there is indeed an increase in interneuron activity prior to the ictal transition, but um, this plot needs a little explaining. So um, I explained before that the ictal wavefront moves slowly through the uh, across the brain surface. It also appears um, at different times relative to seizure onset, depending on the positioning of the array we're recording from relative to the location of seizure onset, which we can't ever really know about since we may or may not be sampling it. Um, and when we do this, we now um, take our um, interneuron and pyramidal cell population firing rates and we normalize them uh, timing-wise to the peak of the ictal wave front. So uh, we're, in other words, we're focusing here on the ictal transition at the local brain tissue that we are recording from. And when we do that, we find that there is a very sharp increase in pyramidal, not pyramidal, parvalbumin interneuron firing, and um, it reaches a peak and then abruptly drops. Um, that peak precedes the peak of pyramidal cell firing by about half a second, and um, but and then and it and the pyramidal cells begin firing once the interneurons have stopped firing, uh, not stopped firing, but have dropped their uh, firing rate. However, notice that the interneurons don't stop firing. In fact, they continue to fire at a high level that is, uh, in fact, greater than what you see prior to the seizure, but they have somehow become less effective. So this uh, reflects the result of that MIRI uh, 2018 study um, from Jessica Cardin's lab that um, interneurons continue to fire just uh, but their function has been somehow disrupted. Uh, now I didn't tell you all the story with the uh, single unit recordings. We actually had two types of single unit recordings that were analyzed. Um, the, um, we used uh, Utah arrays to record for neocortical sites and Benke freed uh, microwires here to record from hippocampal sites. And what we found is that the behavior of interneurons was dramatically different between the two. So neocortical interneurons increased firing as we showed. However, the hippocampal interneurons, um, mainly uh, interneurons, actually stopped firing. About half of them stopped firing. Um, 
and very few of them increase their firing. So this is suggesting that there are potentially different mechanisms between neocortex and hippocampus during human seizures. Now, many of the animal studies have been done on hippocampal brain slices or hippocampal recordings, and uh, those uh, findings are uh, not supported by what, or do not match what we're finding here. So uh, I think there's some mechanisms that may yet to be uncovered here. And then finally, um, we did in fact um, look at out-of-phase firing. This is a bit of a work in progress, um, but we find that in um, a rare type of seizure onset, which involves rhythmic delta activity um, prior to the uh, ictal transition, we find that there is out-of-phase firing of interneurons. They, they completely lose their timing with respect to um, pyramidal cell firing, and uh, this altered timing may itself be contributing to inhibitory failure. And uh, uh, again, we're investigating this, but um, this could be a combination of an effect from depolarization block or from uh, the um, abnormal chloride dysregulation. And um, again, work in progress. So in summary, um, the ictal wavefront is the definition, basically, electrographically, of the ictal transition. It is generally invisible to EEG recordings, moves slowly. Um, triggers fast-moving discharges and drives inhibitory failure uh, during the seizure spread. The ictal transition mechanisms, um, so far, um, our evidence from human data indicates possible roles for chloride dysregulation and depolarization block. The dynamics of neocortical and hippocampal um, um, neuronal activity during seizures, however, are sharply differing in humans. Um, and we find also no direct support for the rebound excitation hypothesis. And I'd like to thank my lab members and collaborators for contributing to this work. Thank you. That's really uh, impressive. Very difficult and very important. I think we only have time for one question. Yeah. Uh, I'll just uh, take uh, Chair's prerogative and choose it. Uh, an incredible body of work. Do you think these neurons undergoing ictal transitions are normal neurons being subject to abnormal conditions, or do they have intrinsic firing abnormalities? Do you think we can detect firing abnormalities interrectally? From Aswin Chari. Um, very good question. Um, I think that um, in some cases, I think in some cases, yes, there are um, intrinsic tissue-related abnormalities. Um, we are actually looking at human tissue samples now to may partially answer those questions. Um, it's uh, you know, it's often not abnormalities you would see on an MRI uh, scan, since this occurs in many patients who are clearly non-lesional by neuroimaging. Um, but there are, are certainly molecular underpinnings of this. Now, we know also that this process can occur in normal tissue. Um, however, um, since patients often have a focus that arises from a single spot, stereotypically over and over, there is almost certainly something there that makes the, that tissue much more susceptible to this process. Thank you very much.